Live and direct, you are tuned in to the Bro Diallo Show. Broadcasting straight out of the sanctuary hypocrisy that is the city of Chirac, State of Drill, Illinois. Today is July 20th in the year of your Lord, 2018. Oh, you can listen to uh, 24 Radio on iTunes, tune in at search Q, the number 4, Q-U-E, the number 4. And if you're in the Chicago area, you can listen live at AM 1680. And during our live broadcast, if you are so compelled, you can call in 312-985-7834. All right. Um, I don't know. Am I here? I don't know. Like I said, I, it's this one man band thing. It's kind of it ain't it ain't optimal, but it is what it is. It's a lot to get into this morning. But first, allow me to wish you a good morning. Uh, the heat wave has has given at least Chicago a little reprieve. Uh, I know the uh, it's only going to be in the the mid to upper seventies today, where last week we were all the way in the nineties. But of course, the Q4 studio offices keeps it real crispy in here, which is why you see me, even though it's in the midst of uh, dog days of summer, as they call them, I still got my, my, I have to wear my little sweaters for myself. Anyway, there's something new over there I hadn't seen before. Um, now that's out of the way. Did I do my normal complaints about the equipment? Yes, check. Weather? Check. And, uh... The AC in the studio, check. Okay, it's off to a good morning. Good, because, you know, sometimes I, I come in here and I'm a little sleep depraved because I had to get up at 5. Not that I would. Not that I would. If y'all gave me that Umar money, I definitely would not move up here. Uh, but I'm just saying, it is what it is. I'm not really articulating a desire to. I'm just articulating the reality that I, I ain't got it like that, but, I, I, you know, I, I'm content. I'm not, I don't have those types of ambitions for uh, increasing my uh, um, consumption capacity. Anyway, uh, I, I'm trying to, I really, I don't even want to talk about this. I don't really even want to talk about this issue because it's kind of maddening. It's somewhat obscure also for, for the masses of black people. But I, I, I guess I'll just get into it. Let me get this out of the way first, because I got some other stuff I want to talk about, especially this uh, universal basic income coming to the city of Chicago. But so yesterday, or was it the day before yesterday? I think the ceremony was the day before yesterday. Their uh, National Black Chamber of Commerce gave uh, Illinois Governor Bruce Rauner a Lifetime Achievement Award. And if you don't know what the National Black Chamber of Commerce is, it's the black version of your Chamber of Commerce, which I assume is predominantly white, since we got a black version of it. And you know, our black folks, if we can't join white folks' party, then we go and make some, uh, some, some, you know, black offshoot. You know, because if white folks won't let us play in, in their sandbox, then we go up and try to duplicate their sandboxes. And I'm not sure why, especially our talented tenth, haven't figured out we could just go do our own thing and do it our own way. But nope, if we can't have what white folks got, we want at least a replica. Or to quote, a man whom I respect, who I think is a great, if you're going to have politician, you're going to want a politician of his caliber. Um, Adam Clayton Powell said, we want no more than you have, but we'll accept no less than you have, which was a cold-blooded statement in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, for black people to assert that they want no more than what white folks got, but they'll accept no less than what white folks got, that was really a, that was like, wow, what an assertion. But you have to put it in its proper historical and political context. This was the Jim Crow era, you know. So that was a radical statement. But as we evolve beyond our ancestors, as we seek to build on the foundation they laid to us as we seek to take the baton in advance we shouldn't just repeat what they said that's not progress they we have to expand 
on what they said. And so maybe in 1956, it was okay to want no more than what white people have and accept no less. But anyway, that's what the Chamber of Commerce is. It's from that era of black folks saying, we want no more than what white people have, but we'll accept no less. And if you don't let us in, uh, there's a quote, uh, Carter G. Woodson, you know, black man wants to be at the table and uh, the miseducation of the Negro, where essentially he's saying, he didn't say non-education of the Negro, all of us fighting for education. He said the miseducation which is something I think we've overlooked. We're so busy fighting for education, we're not fighting for correct education, proper education. African revolutionary education. But in the miseducation, it means that you do develop skills, you do develop techniques, you do gain insights and information, but the way you apply them the way you prioritize them is n not in your own in personal best interest or in your people's short-term or long-term interest. So we have a lot of miseducated people out here. And even when you see, and I think the miseducation of Lauren Hill is a perfect example since she sought to, you know, use our great ancestors text, which I think is fully appropriate, the miseducation of Lauren Hill. Girl, you better watch out. Some guys, some guys are only about that thing, that thing, that thing. If you look at how her, and not to pick on her, I, I think this is insightful. How she had all these insights about fake nails done by Koreans and blue contacts and wigs and how, you know, not to let dudes play you, you know, be very aware situational awareness in terms of when you interact with someone and that that has ill intent that seeks to exploit you that doesn't really have your best interest as hard she had all this insight but yet she fell into many of the same traps in her personal life that she was trying to warn other women about that's miseducation where you have information you're a black man with the information on how to build an economy how to manage a company how to uh set up a defense perimeter, how to arm yourself, train yourself and others on, on, on military offensive and defensive maneuvers. You have all this insight, but yet you still fall victim to all the things that this knowledge is supposed to pr protect you from. That's miseducation. That's menticide. So Lauren Hill was giving a lot of good advice in her music, inspiring black women, but you know, less than a, a well, about a decade later, She's standing on stage with fake nails by, done by Koreans, doing the exact same thing. Light colored contacts, all the things she disparaged. So she wasn't playing. It wasn't just hyperbole. It wasn't just artistry and poetry when she said miseducation. From what we see on the outside looking in, that's evidence of miseducation. Well, and I'm saying that a lot of us, a lot of us got this story to tell. And ain't just Lauryn Hill, but you know, Money and Bus didn't sell 20 million albums to, to display that with. But, you know, I digress. Back to the uh, Chamber of Commerce. These are black business interests. And when I had a successful black business in Kansas City, before I sold it, because um, we were leaving, we had to leave Kansas City. But up to that moment, we had a, a very successful business. And then I didn't really do the black business thing. And, you know, I don't know if I've gone into that about how black businesses don't function like businesses. And so I don't know. It's, it's a confusing thing, how huh, the black business. But I wasn't a capitalist. That was my problem. I didn't set up this business to, for the generation of profit. But that's another story. Long story short, when I had a successful business and my business kind of became, there was a program in Kansas City called New Tools which was basically an initiative of, of, of affluent people of black Kansas City, because there was a new mayor, uh, uh, Obama was elected office, and there was this, this energy in the air saying that, you know, this is a transformative time. So there was this new tools initiatives, which was a series of, of, of public and private partnerships and public policies that was going to economically transform 
the black community. It was a black agenda for the black community. But long story sh even shorter, a lot of that organizing was done in my restaurant, Cafe C. It was a vegan restaurant, the first and only vegan restaurant at that time. Now there's a bunch of vegans. The first vegan restaurant in Kansas City was founded by black folks, ran own lock stock and barrel by black folks and now there's a plethora of black uh, of vegan restaurant not one of them black owned not one and we sold our business a, a, a turnkey business we trained the new people but those were black capitalists and I'm saying you know the way we set this thing up it's not gonna work it's not a profit machine you gotta you know you gotta live it you know not saying you can make a living here, but you ain't going to, you know, be balling. And, but anyway, short, relatively shorter story, even for short. And I was invited to join the Black Chamber of Commerce. And I refused because it's a, a pro-capitalist. It's a black capitalist or whatever the hell that is. Black conservative, black capitalist. And I was like, oh, I don't want it. But, you know, they learned me because they were like, well, there's things we can offer you. There's things we can do for you. And if you become a member of the Black Chamber of Conference, a Conference, it opens you up. But I'm like, well, I was trying to start a, a, a adversarial, which I'm still working on building. Damn, it's hard. Man, y'all make stuff hard. A cooperative, uh, a cooperative enterprise collective. And instead of having a capitalist or a chamber of commerce have co cooperative enterprise uh, organizations, which I'm still trying to put together, but that's another tragic story. Maybe I'll tell that story one day, my experience with founding up to this date three cooperative enterprises, unsuccessful cooperative enterprises just here in the city of Chicago. Maybe I'll tell y'all that story, but I have to change the names to protect the, the guilty. But anyway, the Chamber of Commerce is where all your black successful businessmen, your black educated class, where the talented 10, the black 1% huddle together to protect their interest. And there's something you have to understand when you talk about black people and racism. All black people suffer from racism. But not all black people have the same understanding of overcoming racism or have the same understanding of how racism harms them. So black capitalists, when, they, when you talk about we have to fight racism in a room full of black people, everybody's like, yes, no black person likes racism. But when you go to each individual black person and you ask them, how has racism harmed you? And what do you define as racism, uh, as lifting racism? And some black people will gen genuinely tell you racism means prevents me from having sex with white women. You know, if it wasn't for racism, I could have me a beautiful white woman. And so the end of racism, I'm fighting to be with a white woman. And the end of racism means I can walk down the street with my white woman without having black women and, and other people leer at me or judge me. And that's their fight. So the moment they put a ring on it, they're over. They're leaving the struggle. Like, where's Jabbo? Jabbo, you know, got married. He got engaged. He said racism is over. Race, the, the significance of race. No, I'm telling you. Some black people think racism means being excluded from white neighborhoods. Or like Malcolm X said, they can't sit on the toilet to front next to white people. He said that's where some black people were literally in the struggle, facing water hoses, being spat upon, being stoned by white people, and, and going through all this struggle for what? Why are you fighting racism? And they will say to you, because I want to sit on the toilet next to white folks. I want to move into a white neighborhood. I want my children to go to a white school. I want to be able to dwell in white spaces and feel fully embraced. And so when they are able to do that, the struggle is over for them. That's why we get so confused in, this, in our mass movements, because we have never sat down to get this ideological, ideological clarity. Now, I'm going to tie this back in. What the hell does the Black Chamber of Commerce 
giving a lifetime achievement reward to an overtly racist governor. What does that mean? This is part of it. It ain't just about the Chamber of Commerce. Those are just some tight suit wearing, code switching Uncle Toms. But it, it, it speaks to a larger issues within our community. Lack of clarity that we have, the lack of analysis that we've engaged in. So you go to this people and say, well, once I get me a nice house on the Upper West Side, the Gold Coast, once my child gets into that selective enrollment school or into that nice private school, once I get a corner office in that corporate tower, then the fight is over. And then we, we still like, what the deal? Yo, where you at? Where's Sister Sharifa? Oh, Sister Sharifa that moved to the Upper West Side, got that good job and got her child into that selective college prep school. The fight is over for her because that's what she defined racism as. Getting close to, getting closer proximity to white people. And some black folks say, what is racism? How has racism harmed you? And what is the solution? And these black chamber of commerce says, racism has prevented me from amassing fiat currency. I do not have a, 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 a bank full of fiat currency and a high level of consumption capacity. I don't have five or six homes, five or six cars. I can't charter a jet or a helicopter. Therefore, that's what racism is preventing me from doing, setting up a factory in Bangladesh so I could get some sweatshop labor going. It has prevented me from setting up a mining uh, conglomerate and extracting resources, using child labor to extract resources from the Amazon or from uh, the Congo. So racism has prevented me from fully actualizing my capitalist potential, from fully actualizing my earning potential. And so the fight against racism is the fight to set up black capitalists, to get more black billionaires, more black, uh, what do they call, uh, tycoons. Or what, like the rappers say, the more black moguls. We need more Mayweathers. The, fate, the fight is to get more black people on the Forbes 500 list. And so when they start to see, they start to, and so that's their fight. And then you come to somebody like me and say, what's fight? the fight for race? So my fight is to demand, dismantle all the systems and institutions of global white domination, to take away the capacity of white people to wage war across the globe, to extract resources from the globe, to disrupt uh, 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 traditional indigenous and African and, 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 and uh, uh, Pacific Island cultures to secure the reparations, the stolen reparations from the Western world. My list of what racism is and the solutions is totally different. But I'm black, you black, she black, we all black, we all claim we against racism, but we all have a different impression of what racism does and what the solution to racism looks like. So after you got your house, you got your white spouse and you got your a multi-million dollar bank account, y'all leaving the fight. And I'm still here. And I'm like, I thought we was on the same side. This is what happens. So when things like the Black Chamber of Commerce, because every black person talks this nonsense about black businesses, we need black business, when we really don't. That's neither here nor there. Saying black, it's like saying black people run around like we need during the era of chattel slavery and say we need black, black uh, plantations. We need black plantations. As if an African picking cotton on a black owned plantation would be better than an African picking cotton on a white owned plantation. And some of y'all are that far gone. Some of y'all are that goddamn stupid. Some of y'all really think, well, there's a black-owned water company, privatized water company, for-profit water company, bottled water company in Walmart. Black people sitting across the boardroom table with Walmart executives negotiating deals. Black power! What? Some of y'all really celebrate when Forbes did a, a cover story on African billionaires. And y'all did the Holy Coast dance. Y'all stuck y'all elbows out behind y'all back and y'all did that little tiny step toe dance that they do down the aisles when they really get going to church. Y'all did the Holy Ghost two step because there's all these dozens of black billionaires on the African continent. So some of y'all are that far gone. Some of y'all see that as progress. 
and I'm not saying we don't need black businesses. I'm telling you, black businesses are neither here nor there. We can have them or don't have them. Because really, it's about the economic structures of, uh, within which you're building black businesses. So if you're building black businesses in a, a chattel slave economy, then black businesses have to engage the, and support the chattel slave economy to thrive. So all business in, isn't inherently good or evil. It depends on the larger uh, uh, economic culture, economic policies, economic value system that you're operating black businesses in. So if you're operating black businesses in a hyper-exploitative, ecocidal, oppressive economy, then black businesses are going to have to get with that program. And all of the most successful black businesses, the Forbes-level black businesses, or the men like Herman Cain, the black mega CEOs, they get with that program. And so when, when the National Black Chamber of Commerce had announced that Governor Rauner, who is in a tight election run, he's, he's, uh, his, he's very vulnerable. Rauner has, is running in a, a traditionally Democratic state, a blue state. He's a Republican governor in a blue state, which means he has all the rural whites on lock but he doesn't have any strong votes coming from the population centers, which are very important. And he has an opponent, even though Rauner's a multi, multi-millionaire, $800, $750 million, his opponent's a multi-billion dollar dude. So he has an opponent that can spend him over and up under the table. So he's vulnerable right now. So he's grasping for straws. So he needs to be seen and associated. He, he, he has pissed off the far right, the Trumpites, because he's tried to disassociate himself from Trump. He's also signed a, uh, uh, a pro-abortion bill that has the, the pro-life fascist, the breed white baby faction of the Republican Party. And we need to stop calling them pro-life or even anti-abortion, because they love abortions of non-white women and non-white babies. We need to come up with another name with the right-wing conservative who uh, oppose abortion for white life. I call them the, 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 the pro-breeder faction. They're not anti-abortion, they pro-breed white babies, the white baby faction. You know, the Aryan Breeder Association. I don't know. But we need to stop pretending like this is just about loving life. I'm pro-life. Bull crap. I ain't met one pro-anti-abortionist that's pro-life. Not one. Because you say, what, do you, what is your stand on, stance on military spending? We got to keep America strong. What is your stance on the death penalty? If you do the crime, then the punishment. What is your uh, position on immigration? Keep them out of our country. What about refugees? To hell with them. Let them deal with their own problem. I've never seen an anti-abortionist who's had a completely humane platform, our ideological or political platform. They're anti-abortion, but they're not pro-life. They're pro-breeding. They want to breed white babies because they think numerical majorities is somehow going to help them maintain their racial advantage. Because they see what happens in, but, in, but anyway. So the Chamber of Commerce, anyway, you got a Republican. And so this Republican is making deals. He's vulnerable. He only has a little bit of time left in office, he feels. Because J.B. Pritzker and Juliana Stratton is they're on his ass, or what passes for an ass, his flank, his shank, whatever. They're on him. They're on his backside. They're on him. And it's not looking so good in the polls. And I'm sure the Republican machine, because which it's in great, engages in enormous level of election fraud. They're kicking uh, black voters, minority voters off the rolls. They're... Uh, 
uh, gerrymandering, they're cooking, they're doing everything they can, but they can only do so much. They can only do so much, engage in so much election fraud while still having an air of legitimacy. So they, they, he's vulnerable. So what Rauner is doing, he's running around getting cozy with uh, the far right. He needs to appeal to the far right and siphon off some uh, votes from conservative Democrats. And that's exactly what he's doing. He's actually doing a pretty good job. I mean, if I was his advisor, I'd tell him to do this same nonsense. So you'll find Rauner, at one week, he's at a dinner praising Mike Pence, at some ceremony praising Mike Pence, who is the uh, former Indiana governor and the current vice president. And this guy is a religious nut. But he obviously watches Dr. Umar on YouTube because Mike Pence feels that homosexuality is the downfall of the white family and the downfall of the white nation. So he's aggressively anti-homosexual. And he wants to end gay marriage. He wants to end the right of adoption. He wants to take away all the civic and social rights from the gays. And Rauner shows up at his speech saying he's one of the greatest leaders of the 20th second century. He's a great leader. I love this man. He's a great man. And so all the far right wingers say, ah, yay, Rauner, yay. Yes, he's our guy, MAGA. Get your MAGA on. And then the following week, that same governor will go to a gay wedding and give the toast, the, the groom grooms, to I don't know the terminology. The groom groom, he'd stand up and toast the gay, so he's at a gay very publicly. And he's like, these gays here are my friends. They're great people. I'm so happy they found love. Let's all have a toast. And he gave a toast. And then <laughs> Rauner will turn around and sit down and say, well, I want the police in Illinois to be a special pr protected class. I want to give extra penalties, like to attack a policeman is considered a hate crime. I want to bring down the hammer on anyone that violates, that refuses to submit to the full authority of the police. I'm pro-police. I love the cops. In a, in a state where the cops have been caught, you know, literally running black site torture chambers, falsely accusing black people, just have been tyrannical towards the black residents and citizens of Illinois. And then the next week, he's here at the Black Chamber of Commerce doing a milliwop, you know, dabbing on us. And I'm sure they had to tell him, listen, uh, the colors, they're not whipping and nay naying anymore. And I think, you know, milliwop, they've got a few dances. We just can't keep up. I, but I know milliwop, I know whipping and nay nay is over. So when you go up on stage, dab on them. Dab is, has some real hole. You know, just go up there and when they give you the award, do a little dab, they'll lose their, their collective assholes. They'll just flip out. Get up there, Rounder. Go, boy. So he went up there. I'm sure he rehearsed the dab for three months. And they gave him a Lifetime Achievement Award. And why? Because they claim that Rounder is pro-business. Now, this is a uh, governor who reinstated the death penalty, even though the Illinois death penalty has been shown to be biased. Well, he wanted to reinstate the death penalty. And he said he wanted automatically death penalty for anyone that caused uh, uh, bodily harm or death to a police officer. That's one of his sucking up to the right wing things. And so you ask, how can this any organization calling itself black give an award to an overtly racist Republican uh, governor that's aligned and supportive of the Trump administration, that has tried to cut programs, that had successfully subverted, almost led to, uh, his policies led to the sh almost shutdown and massive layoffs of black civil servants who is, 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 is doing, uh, who's trying to subvert labor unions. And a big part of the black middle class in Illinois are educational professionals. And he's done everything he could to subvert the, the, the teachers' unions to get do away with tenure. Rauner has been a catastrophe for black people in his policies. And I know y'all like, oh, Democrats and Republicans. Do, do, do. I know y'all like to just throw these blanket things instead of, you know, doing a, 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 a what do they call a, a, 
itemized evaluation of, of policy. Y'all get caught up in personalities. Y'all get caught up in titles and, and, and pomp and circumstance. I don't like the donkey or the elephant, nor do I. But you got to give a proper diagnosis if you're going to offer uh, intelligent opposition to them. But if you're not really interested in offering intelligent opposition to them, but just responding to what they do or don't do. Now, I see I got some people up in arms of why I say we don't need black businesses. But I'll come back to that in terms of needing or not needing black businesses. And so the Black Chamber of Commerce, that's something you have to understand about these black elites, about black wealthy people, about black businessmen and black business women, is that they dwell in a different space. They have a different set of priorities and a different outlook. And they used to be honest about that. In the old timey days, back during the turn of the last century, the black elite the talented 10th, the black 1%, would be very open of saying that we are a special breed of blackness. We are a particular breed of black people. And we have special abilities and special status above and beyond the black masses. And we know this, and the black rest of you blacks should accept this, and that's just how it is. And they would openly tell black people, stop all that marching, stop all that weeping and wailing and moaning and gnashing of your teeth, stop making trouble, stop being disruptive and accept your lot in life. Cast down your pail where you stand. And if you're gonna get caught a nigger while you're shoveling the streets of white folks, then you shovel those streets and you be the best street shoveler. And when you're caught a nigger, you avert your eyes, you bow your head and you do what you gotta do to just get by because that's your lot in life. Now you had some exceptions, but for the most part, the Madam C.J. Walker types, they would throw us crumbs. They would open up gallery openings. They'd pick a few bright little uh, coloreds from the ghetto and send them off to finishing school or some type of private school. They'd make little donations. They'd give out turkeys. But for the most part, they didn't want to disrupt the status quo because they are profiting from the status quo. So if I'm a black billionaire, why the hell would I want to disrupt the whatever situation brought me to billionaireism? Why would I want to go to the coal, uh, Congo and shut down the coal tan mines? Or why would I want the uh, Western industries to have to pay market rates for Africa's resources, for Latin American resources? Why would I want to stop the, 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 the clear cutting of the Amazon? Why would I want to stop the pollution of the, the oceans? Why would I want to stop the imperialist U.S. military machine from going overseas to, pers uh, to repress uprisings? Why would I want anything to topple this system if I'm sitting at the tippy-toppy of it? I'm going to give up my billion dollars just so you, we can stop having random black people shot down in the street? I'm going to pay additional taxes so that we can give reparations to oppressed black people. So there was a time where the black elites, there's a good book on the, the founder of this whole mentality called Black Judas. And, and even the Chicago Defender has articles that you could pull up that when poor black people were coming here, had their, their land stolen, their, their homes burned, their beloved ones lynched and came here chased up here, coming up north. And then when they came north, the union members would lynch black people. Oh, the blacks coming up here, just like blacks, uh, Mexicans coming across. They're going to lower our wages. They're going to take our jobs. And the black elites would write articles in the Chicago Defenders saying, don't wear your overalls in the street. Learn to speak soccer English and sit up and carry yourself. Don't walk the streets like a baboon. And be shaming black people. All those Southern blacks coming up here, making us all look bad. And old top hat and tails wearing black folks. Black folks wearing ascots and cover bunches. And they used to be a lot more open with it. They used to be a lot more real with it about not only accepting that, hey, there are upper class and lower classes. And that's how the white people organize themselves. And I don't see any reason why that's not how blacks should organize ourselves. And that's how it was. 
And then black people in the 50s like, enough of this. So we're going to tear down this system. And for the longest time, starting with uh, Booker T. Washington, the black elites, the wealthy blacks, their primary obligation to the system, say, listen, the white man told wealthy blacks, we give you an opportunity to rise above to use your talent, to pull yourself up by the bootstrap. And we let you get, you know, buy our old mansions, buy our old Rolls Royces, buy our old top hats, buy your wives, my, buy your, uh, uh, my, wives, my wife's discarded silk gown for your wife. We give you privileges above and beyond. But as an obligation, in return for these special privileges we give you, we want you to keep all the rest of the niggas in check. And they were like, why didn't you say so? Right, I'm, that's an easy deal. I think I came out on top in that negotiation. So in the 1950s, black folks was like, enough is enough. We didn't got enslaved. And then after slavery, we got Jim Crow. And after, we've had enough. And we'd been told by Booker T and the Talented Ten, we were even told by W.E.B. Du Bois if we learn to speak standard English and we stop wearing these old brogarn shoes and these old dusty overalls and get us some slacks and some wing tips. We were told that if we, that white folks would meet us halfway, if we show our willingness to be loyal citizens to America, if we show our willingness to, to, to be educated Americans, to, to, to speak the Queen's English, then they would respect our humanity give us our share of the resources and open up the same opportunities to us as they give to everybody else. And it was all a lie. So burn it down, burn it all down. And again, there were some black folks that were at that meeting that said, you know, cause they black and they ran to white. And it's like, listen, colored folks didn't had enough. Not only are they saying burn this down, they're looking at Haiti. They're looking at Brazil. They're looking at uh, um, uh, Jamaica. They're looking at Ghana. They're about to link up and lock arms with the whole world, the whole black world, and say to hell with white folks. They realize y'all are a minority. It's trouble, boss. Our, so we sick, boss. We in trouble, boss. And I didn't profit in an African system. I didn't make my wealth in, in an African system. I didn't elevate in the African system. I elevated in your system. So all my wealth and status is tied to you staying in power. So many black people directly cooperated with the oppressor. I, let me not say many, uh, the 1%, again, 1% white folks, 1% black folks, the one half of 1%. So he was like, well, I'll put you over. And instead of making it a black liberation struggle, we'll make it a black liberation, uh, a black integration struggle. And so I'll go get some black people with PhDs like Dr. Martin Luther King, upper middle class affluent blacks. And I'll displace the rabble rousers. I'll kill off the mega evers the unsanctioned, unapproved black leaders. I'll exile Robert F. Williams, the true leaders of the founders of the true black liberation struggle, and I'll flip it. And then that way, we'll, instead of having black people tear down the system, we'll have black people fighting to join the system. And then we'll create this illusion that any black person that's willing to work hard and sacrifice can become rich one day. Don't worry, I got this. I've, I've, I've undermined and subverted and distorted revolutions all over the world. No, point in me not being able to do it here in my own backyard. And that's what they did. And many black people helped. King was a, uh, one of the people who sat and negotiated. And white people would tell King, here's some money, King. Here's a Nobel Peace Prize, King. Here's access to the media. And, and he, you're, you're our boy. But don't march here on this day. Don't address this topic. Don't go here. Don't go there. And they gave King instructions and King followed. But King was a man of conscience. He was a man of development. So King eventually was like, I'm sick of being a black elite. I'm sick of being the talented tent. So King committed what they call class suicide. And King was denounced by Abernathy, uh, the, the, uh, uh, um, the Baptist Convention, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, when King, at his death, had been stabbed in the back and betrayed by all his closest allies because they were like, you were supposed to be fighting for integration and here you is over here talking about liberation. You going to meet with uh, Elijah Muhammad. You meeting with uh, uh, Kwame Nkuma. You here talking to uh, uh, Kwame Ture 
listening to that maniac. Here you are. You and he's like, I. It's just it ain't the move no more. So I'm a, so King committed class suicide. So I ain't saying the the, the Chamber of Commerce type Negroes ain't a total loss. Every now and then we'll get one to cross back over to us. And but even though King betrayed the integrationist movement and became loyal to his people, the integrationist struggle went, won. And now you have black people feeling pride when they see Beyonce and Jay-Z, uh, they just this uh, week, Jay-Z surpassed Puff Daddy as the highest earner and you see uh, Money Mayweather and, and uh, who just bought, oh, Gucci Mane just bought a billion dollar watch and black people living in the slums are celebrating that. Not just as admiration of these people's success, but as an achievement for us all. Look what black people are doing, we getting it. Black people are dancing in the streets. Look, LeBron James got the $94 million shoe deal. LeBron James going to LA and gonna make money, more money, more money, more, as if that means anything. In fact, a lot of the money that Gucci Mane, Jay-Z and all of that make gets reinvested into the system to keep us suppressed and oppressed. So it is not actually a contradiction where the uh, National Black Chamber of Commerce will give an overt Republican white racist scumbag governor a lifetime achievement award. Because their understanding and engagement with racism is not the same as our understanding and engagement of racism. Their idea of the defeat of racism is not the same as our defeat of racism. So the next time you huddle up with black people and every black people are like, yeah, we need unity. Say, what the hell do you mean by unity? Well, unity means everybody coming to my business and giving me money so that I can uh, get amass more fiat. And as I amass more fiat, I can buy property. I can become a slumlord. I can go out and get a nice house among white people, send my kids to the best white schools. And that's unity. Everybody supporting me and my individual aspirations. And I might give some money to charity. I might pass out some turkeys on Thanksgiving, but not the good turkey. Not the whole food free range organic turkeys. But I'll get y'all some turkeys from Save a Lot. Generic market. Grade D but edible turkeys twice a year. You know. And then you ask somebody like me, what's unity? Oh, that's black people coordinate their talent, efforts, and resources to subvert the, the status quo. And the dude's like, whoa, but black dynamite, I am the status quo. Chuck D told us, what, 20, 30 years ago, every brother ain't a brother. So I'm not outraged. In fact, you know, you ever have something? I had, it's this peculiar thing black folks go through. You ever been, uh, like, shocked but not surprised? You ever been shocked but not, okay, and I'll tell you how it works. You live in a house, and some of y'all haven't had this experience, but some of y'all had. I know some of y'all personally had. I personally had this experience. You live in a house with a crackhead. And you know damn well stuff gonna come up missing. But every time it happens, I don't care if it happens three times a week, you're shocked but not surprised. So you walk in, you get up, you wanna eat a hot pocket before you go off to your substandard, to your low quality school. You get up, get dressed in your low quality clothes and get and, and get cleaned up in your substandard housing to go to your low quality school from the projects. You know, I'm speaking for myself. And you say, I'm going to microwave me a hot pocket before school. So I have some nourishment <laughs> before I go and be miseducated. And the damn microwave is gone. And you knew every day the microwave was there. You're more surprised like, what? The microwave is still here. But one day... Uncle Kirk, rest in peace. He was on a binge. He was on a bender. He snatched the microwave, and the microwave's gone. And you know, you live in a house that, and we on food stamps, so we buy high calorie, low price food, highly processed food. The microwave was a, a highly necessary asset for my family, and it's gone. And I'm not surprised, like, oh, it's fine. Now. I'm like thinking, what took so long? but I'm still shocked, ah! So it's a weird feeling, like, shock and awe, like, you know, I was expecting this, but now that what I expected, I got what I expected, I'm still outraged and shocked and surprised and disappointed. It's a weird sensation. 
that's the thing with the uh, the uh, National Black Chamber of Commerce. Of course, they're going to give white racists lifetime achievement award. Of course, they want to tell their constituents, yes, we have an inside track with the governor, and the governor is going to give black contractors set asides and help us a few black businesses get in. And what are black contractors and engineers? What are they doing? They're building prisons. You know, right now there are black. Chamber of Commerce, uh, Rami Malu is building a new $100 million police facility on, on, the, on the west side that they don't need. They already have a, 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 a police right downtown, right over by uh, Malcolm X College. They got a police training facility. I go by there from time to time because my sons used to take music class over at the Merritt School of Music, guitar and piano classes. And so I'd go and you see the new cadets, the new trainees, the new, you know, proto-fascists, little budding fascists. They're so cute in their little light blue uniforms. You know, kind of like, remember the clone center where, where uh, uh, Star Wars, Rise of the Clone Wars, where they had the little cloning area? They all kind of same expression, same dead print expression, where you go to have your soul sucked out so that you can be a fascist cop. Um, they already have a facility, but there are black people that says, you say to some com community members, uh, what, what is your issue? What, what is the problem with the, uh, $900 million police or $95 million police facility? What is your problem with that? Well, it's extracting resources from other public, uh, institutions such as public education. And that money, you wouldn't need to train more and more police if you put $95 million into uh, uh, urban development and development of, of neglected communities, red line communities. So that's my problem with it. It's a misappropriation of the people's resources. Then you ask somebody else, what is your issue with the $95 million police training facility? Well, my problem is that there aren't enough black contractors. There aren't enough black electricians and black contractual firms. They need to buy the cement for the facility, and they need to buy the arms from a black contractor. So their problem is black people aren't profiting enough from exploitation, whereas your problem is exploitation. But y'all both black, y'all both have a problem, and you think, well, I can unite with this Negro, this pack of hot dog neck Negro, I can unite with him, because we're both black, and we both have a problem with this new uh, facility. And so when I walk in the office and I tell Rom, how dare you? You put this money into public schools. You put this money into to early childhood education. You put this money into health care, mental health facilities. You put this money into reparations for the black red line communities. You put this money into cleaning up the lead and other toxic waste that's in the soil around the south side from Chicago's industrial fallout. That's where you need to put that money, damn you, Rom. And then you march out of the office and then you see the brother with the nice suit. And he's standing out there, it's like, yeah, this brother's a leader in the business community. Now he's about to go tell Rom out, too. And so this guy goes into the office, shuts the door, throws down a little sand onto Rom Emanuel's hardwood floor and starts to, to tap dance and shuffle. And we're like, Rom, well, you know, we, uh, we, we have a list of uh, uh, select contractors and we'd like to uh, uh, do the facilities and groundskeepers and uh, janitorial services. And then he walks out like, I let Rom know this is unacceptable. And we, that's why we don't understand. And people get mad at me because they don't like me criticizing black leaders, black organizations, and uh, uh, calling out black businesses, saying black businesses don't really mean a damn thing. Y'all get really mad at me. But this is how they get us. This is how they get us. And then the black contractor, the black chamber of commerce dude gets the contract and he comes like, we have a victory. I don't know why they always get those jowls. They're like pigs. I guess if you have a pig mentality, you start to morph into a pig. And they have those thick rolls on their necks. And they have those big, thick faces. Yeah, go, go, don't lie to me. Sharpton, he, he, got, he got his surgically fixed. But go look at Jesse Jackson. Go look at any hateful Uncle Tom Negro. And you tell me they don't have that same type of aura. Pack of hot dog necks. Look at Kanye back when he was talking about the white man get paid off of all of that. Look at him then and now look at him now that he's a Yankee Doodle Dandy. 
that pack of hot dogs pop right off the back of his neck. I think that's the ancestor's way of telling us who's who. You know, and you come into a black meeting, they want to pat you down, make sure you ain't got no surveillance or weapons on you. We need to just check the back of the neck. <laughs> but I digress. That's how they get us. So we need to pay attention. Go look up the National Black Chamber of Commerce. I was on their website last night. This is what our true black leaders, our black thought leaders, the black people you celebrate, the black people whose home you take your little nieces and nephews and say, look what you can achieve. The black people who, and the United who gave a little money to United Negro College Fund. Go, let me tell you, go to their website. See what they really about. They are imperialists, they are capitalists, and they are white supremacists. Obama is a white supremacist. You ain't gotta be white to be a white supremacist. White supremacist seems that you, even if you hate white people, you could still be a white supremacist. Dr. Umar Johnson is a white supremacist. If you put, if you think that white philosophy, white ideology, white economy, white social theory, white worldview is above every other thing, if you're calling black people who fail to achieve in capitalism, who refuse to embrace capitalism, militarism, patriarchy, if when you, and when you are, all, that's, those are Western ideas, all the way back to the Greeks. Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, they, these philosophies didn't come from nowhere. White folks are not making this stuff up as they go along. They have the canons. The Wealth of Nations, Leviathan by Hobbes. Go back and read these books. This is some, white people are grounded. Even the white people carrying out the white agenda, they don't even know it. But the, the society and institutions are so structured that it's like a rat maze. You ain't even got to know what the, where the maze, who built the maze or where the maze is leading you. All you got to do is just proceed through the maze. And there are black people who embrace these ideas and they want to drape them in candy cloth. They want to douse them in, in patchouli oil. But it's, it's still white ideas. Omar, like I said, Umar is a, a, a white concern. And let me tell y'all something about Umar. Because two to three times a year, Umar has a huge support base here in Chicago. People love him some Umar. Umar comes here and charges $50 a pop. That's more than a movie tickets with popcorn and some gummy bears. They come to here to see Umar perform. Umar has been right in like, two blocks from me. At, at, at the Harold Washington Theater, he's come to perform at the du DuSable Museums. He comes to these iconic black institutions and they sell out $50 a head. Hundreds of people, $50 a head. Umar come here and make bank. Because you know, them Japanese rooftop hot tubs ain't free. Conscious shippers don't come cheap. But now every time there's a crisis, and I know, I understand, Black Chicago is in perpetual crisis. Black Chicago is in perpetual crisis. But every now and then, there's like crisis and then there's hyper crisis. I don't know, we need a whole new term. Because there is no stability, it never levels off. So hyper crisis. Chicago goes from a state of perpetual crisis to hyper crisis. And where's Umar? You come when it's time to collect checks. I mean, even Sharpton, even old messy Jesse. Where's Umar? I mean, damn. I mean, can't you at least consider your $50 ticket to see Umar talk the same tired nonsense? That a down payment? Couldn't have Umar like, man, if, if, if they kill all of us, who going to pay to hear you talk the same old right wing focus on the family conservative nonsense that you blackified and reselling and rehashed, reheated, refried, and sold back to the black community? Can't somebody say where Umar? Even old Sharpton, when there's a crisis, he at least shows up. Even on more, even, even uh, you know, because he collects money. I mean, if y'all was paying me, I'd show up. If there were a couple of hundred black folks, give me fifty dollars. 
You know, if the black community had given me half a million dollars for nothing, oh, and I heard it's up to 750,000 now, almost a million dollars for what? For a promise? At least I at least show up, even if I don't have no solutions, no answers, I, I'll stand in solidarity. I mean, come on, throw on your poof ball hat and come through. Six foot four melanated, come on, come through. But he knows the next time he needs to get some money up, he can announce Dr. Umar will be speaking. Or maybe y'all tell Umar. And Umar will show up if, if a black man, if an unarmed black man is shot by a gay cop or a single, co uh, single mother cop. Maybe he'll show up. But I think Chicago, y'all, I, now I can't call Umar. I ain't been to no Umar nothing. Umar was two blocks from my house. And some brother called and was like, I'd love to see you and brother Umar uh, meet. And I'm like, uh, well, he can come by. I, I, he can come by uh, Sip and Saver. We can meet over some, some green tea. But I ain't about to pay $50. Brother, I'll pay your way. And I'm like, pay my way to see Umar. You can pay, but get, put, put, put some money on my books. What are you talking about? No, nah, hell no. And then some people wanted to show up and protest Dr. Umar. <laughs> I'm like, for what? That just adds, like, what? He's a sexist. He's had that's protest Dr. Umar. Umar thrives off of that. But here's the thing. Umar talks about what? Let me say. But here's another thing. But then again, this is what happened when, when people do show up. Yesterday, there was a, a, a extending ongoing protest for police atrocities, and they marched to uh, Rahm Emanuel's Upper West Side Mansion. You had hundreds of black people and black allies show up at uh, Rahm Emanuel's mansion with a casket. And, and what's even sadder about that is Rahm wasn't even home. <laughs> he had to hear about it. Maybe he saw it on the news or read it in the paper like I did. <laughs> oh, they marching at my house. I mean, do y'all value black folks' time? Do y'all have any respect for black folks' time? Uh, oh, um, but let's move on. I think, let me just leave it at this, with this Chamber of Commerce thing. If you're not class conscious, you're not any kind of conscious. You can't be black conscious, culturally conscious, historically conscious, politically conscious. If you're not class conscious, and you don't have a class critique and a, a, a class-based agenda, then you're just playing games. You're about to get played out and pimped every single time. Class matters. Garvey said race first. He didn't say race only. So after you get your racial analysis, after you establish your racial loyalties, after you construct your racial agenda, you have to infuse it with class analysis, or it will be played. And I'm not saying just hate on someone. Let me just say this, because I got to get to my actual topic from um, the topic of the day. I really like to reserve the first hour for stuff, because there's other stuff. I wanted to talk about the McClure twins in interracial dating. Maybe I'll have time to come to that on the back end. Or interracial marriages. And y'all not going to like what I have to say about interracial relationships. Y'all not going to like that. Y'all also not going to like what I have to say about reformed races, whether or not a racist can become a non-racist. Y'all not going to like none of that. I'm telling y'all right now, y'all about to be mad, but I could tell y'all this. What I do say is historically, politically, and even scientifically sound. So if you're mad at me, be mad at reality. And I'm pissed at reality. I ain't saying don't be mad. I'm mad. I hate reality too, but I, I don't reject it. You know, we all got to be around people we don't like. Just ask my wife. She can't stand me most of the time. But, hey, so just because you don't like something don't mean it ain't, hey, you can't deal with it. If you need help on how to deal with something that gets on your nerves, just holler at my wife. She, she's an expert at that at, by this time. But y'all not going to like what I have to say. And hopefully I'll have time to say it. Or hopefully maybe I won't have time to say it because I can't deal with y'all. Y'all be backlashing on me. 
when I say Republicans and Democrats ain't the same, when I when I say that Trump stole the election, y'all were so mad because y'all were so proud of your anti-Hillary stance. I was proud of your anti-Hillary stance. But you can hate Hillary and still deal with the reality of the Republican. Y'all really, Trump is a habitual, perpetual, pathological liar. But anyway, wh where was I? Oh, I want to say this. You got to beware of class. The Black Chamber of Commerce. You should be shocked. You should be appalled. You should be outraged. But you shouldn't be surprised that a, a, a major black organization would give an overt racist a Lifetime Achievement Award. And we should understand that because they're about their interests. And when we say, when a black person stands up and says unity, we all don't mean the same thing. We need to be specific about what type of unity you talk about. Operational unity, organizational unity, ideological unity. I did a whole show on unity. Oh, and I just wanted to, somebody got mad. It's like, what you mean we don't need businesses? Let me tell you something. Businesses, we could take them or leave them. The Haitian Revolution was one of the most successful black uprisings in history of existence. How many businesses did they have? Harriet Tubman didn't have no damn businesses. In fact, when the white man came here and set up his fortresses, the first thing he established was protocols for whites and, and, and fortifications against the natives. Businesses always reflect the, the, the tone and agenda of the economy that they're set up in. So if you don't have any type of overall economic value system, economic culture, economic protocols, then whatever businesses you want, ain't no such thing as a black business. I say that as a black business owner. And we wonder why Arabs, Jews, Irish, all these other people are more successful at operating businesses uh, within our communities because we have this mythological understanding of what a business is and what a business does and what a business doesn't do. Businesses will not liberate us. You know, and it's like Dr. John Henry Clark and, 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 and Amos Wilson, who wrote the, literally wrote the book on black economic empowerment. Blueprint for Black Power, like an 800 page book. He literally wrote the book on black empowerment. He would always tell us, listen, don't get too caught up in this black business stuff. Bob, you know, when you tell me black businesses, look at Cash Money Records. Look at Herman Cain, a successful black businessman, one of the most successful black businessmen. And he's a damn fool. He ain't got nothing for nobody black. He has said that his allegiances are to his class, not to his race. And we need to get out of the business arena. We'll never beat white folks at their game. As most deaf, I'm sorry, Yasin Bey said, when we start keeping pace, they change up the tempo. So we need black economies. And businesses are just one aspect of an economy. Just like voting is one aspect of politics. It's not the be all end all. So saying we need black businesses in order for liberation is like saying we need black voting for liberation. Black businesses are a component, and it depends on who you vote for, when you vote, when you choose to extract your vote, the negotiations you, you engage in before you, you, you move to vote, the, way, the, the level of influence you have over your larger community in terms of uh, forming a black vote and, and making people hold to that. It's the same thing with businesses. Black businesses, we already have literally thousands of very successful black businesses. I can introduce you to su successful black businessmen. What has that changed? And what do you think it will change? What are y'all thinking? Unless those black businesses, like when I had my first black business, was my dream business. It was a bookstore. I've always wanted to own a bookstore. And I opened up Think Bookstore in Brooklyn, New York. And at this time, there were several black business bookstores. And I went to those black, and, ate, and I was just, it was, I was so well positioned. 
And I went to A and B publishers. I used to literally take a wheelbarrow. Well, not a wheelbarrow, like a basket. Go down to the wholesaler, buy some of the best books, some of the best titles. Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark, John G. Jackson, Professor William Mackey. In fact, these many of these guys were still alive. I would go to their lectures and bring their books, get signed copy. I brought Dale Jones in to speak to the people. Had exclusive access to his books, 9-11 for Blacks Only. It was wonderful. I was in, I was black businessing. And black people would come in there and be like, go oh, black man. And my son was an infant. He was a newborn. Me and my wife ran that store. And I was working at Downstate Medical Center, working the overnight shift. And my wife would run it. And then we put it, it was wonderful. Wonderful. I love being in business. I love engaging in commerce. I love sitting down plotting plans, plotting and scheming. And, the, and, the, and it became a hub, and people will still contact me today. It's like, yo, uh, uh, Think Bookstore is where I got my awakening. In fact, one of the very first showings of the documentary Afropunk, which started the whole Afropunk movement, Think Bookstore was one of the first places he did a public screening of, of that documentary. It had all these weirdo shaved, pierced up black, tattooed up black folk. And this is back in like, what, 2001, 2002? 2003. And I went to all the other black bookstores and I'm like, listen, now we all got businesses. And this is before like, you know, Amazon and all that really decimated the black book industry, but black book business. And I said, here's some things we need to do as black book owners. First of all, we need to support black writers and black publishing. A lot of books are going out of publication before Google came and started putting all the books up. This is early. And I tried to have several, and I said, why don't we all buy in bulk? We can, we can negotiate lower rates from the publishers, and we can influence the type of books that the publisher buys. Because at that time, it was Zane and a lot of like graphic sex books were real hot, like these hood street novels. And I'm like, if we want more scholarly works published, then if we come as a block, if we form a, a, a collective, a cooperative, a black bookstore owner, and we could start in Brooklyn. And then, you know, I know some bookstores in Harlem. Well, I knew of one in Queens, so we can get a con. We can have the national book owners, and then we can go to publishers and say, we want this quality of publication. We want this level of research. We don't just buy what, well, this is what we have. And not one. And these, and I don't mean just black books. These are pro-black, pro-African, revolutionary bookstores. Not one of them was willing to cooperate because they're like, I got mine. You get yours. I'm already established. And every single one of them mofos, not without exception, every single one of them is shut down. And, it, it, and so it ain't just about opening back business. It is about the mentality of the people owning the business. It's about how the resources that come into that businesses are redistributed amongst the people. And it's about the long-term larger agenda of those businesses. Just being black is not enough. I don't care if it's a black judge, black cop, and they send around these pictures of all these sexy black doctors. What the hell is wrong with y'all? And how many times I'm going to tell y'all about disciplined minds? The research has been done. The, I mean, I could tell you about Amos Wilson. Long before Jeff Schmidt wrote Disciplined Minds, Amos Wilson had written that the collective progress of black people is inversely proportional to the individual achievement of black people within this system, which means more black doctors we have, the lower the life expectancy of black people, the higher rate of, of, of infectious and chronic disease we suffer from. The more black cops, the more black judges, the more black prosecutors, the more black incarceration. It doesn't go down, the less justice we have. The more black MBAs, the fewer black businesses. Because people aren't just going in there to get technical skills, they're going in there to get ideological training. So their agenda becomes the agenda, and the agenda becomes their agenda. My wife, when she was getting her PhD studies, I might, I don't know if she'll let me bring it in. But she used to write stuff in the notes of her notes. She would take notes on her notes. And one thing she said, she always had to remind herself and say, she would always have to say, don't get educated out of your mind. And I don't know, I came up in the hood. 
So I know a lot of people that came from nothing and made something of themselves. I know a brother that went on to, to, to H&R Block and Wall Street who came up in the ghetto. And they lived in a basement apartment in the projects. And you think living in the projects is bad? Try living in a basement apartment of the project. They would literally have fungus and mold and mushrooms growing out of their carpet. And to this day, he said he's had issues with his feet because of the, 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 how toxic that synthetic rug was. And his mother had deep psychological issues. She had been a, a, a victim of domestic violence. You know, the same old story. I ain't got to tell y'all the story. It's trite at this point. One of my best friends growing up, and he was like, I ain't trying to live like this. And this dude was one of the most militant, pro-black, revolutionary, kill whitey cats you ever want to know. He was so damn militant. They had a, a Black History Day uh, event, some of y'all might have been there, at Southeast High School. And he ran up on the stage and snatch, snatched the microphone. And he started spewing all this Malcolm X and, and revolution. We need revolution. This is just a caricature of black history. We need to teach real black history. And he said they, they cut off the microphone. So he slammed the microphone and started yelling at the top of his lungs, wake up my people, wake up, to the security and the principals all came. He was so militant that they hired a psychologist, Dr. David, uh, Dr. Davidson, who wrote two good books called Somebody Is Trying to Kill You, Volume 1. They brought a psychologist, but they didn't know the psychologist was a revolutionary, that he was a black militant. They just knew it's a black man with a PhD, so the white folks deemed him worthy of getting a PhD. Therefore, you know, we should respect him. So they brought in a psychologist to, to counsel this young man who was losing his mind. And I guarantee you, this was in the early 90s, 1990, 89, 90, 91. If he was doing that now, they would have called him a, a, a terrorist or something. But anyway, long story short, he didn't like how he came up. He didn't like the conditions of his people, and he was so pro-black. And he was like, I'm going to get educated, I'm going to learn a skill, and I'm going to elevate my people. Dude went to college. He went to Rockhurst College. He got his accounting and finance degree. He went off to, he moved to New York, got into the finance sector, and you talk to him now, he, you, he's a MAGA. He supports imperialism, he supports extraction of resources, he supports the stock market. He was educated out of his mind, to the point where we don't even talk, and we were the best of friends growing up. So that's what it can happen. White folks ain't, they, like I said, white folks been at this a long time and they don't play this by ear. This is not an ad hoc agenda. They are serious about their global domination and they know what they have to do in all sectors from education, entertainment, labor, politics, sex, war, economics, agriculture. Anyway, I'm running out of time. So no, black businesses ain't no, it's like the black vote. It's something that you see and make you feel good after you get it. But if you ain't got the follow through, if you ain't got the proper foundation and you ain't got the appropriate follow through, then it's just a cosmetic thing. A black business ain't no different than some Uncle Tom going to buy a daishiki. It looks good on the surface, but it ain't no substance. And I know we got this cult of black business. We think black business, black people are just so enamored with black businesses and black businessmen and black achievement. It's a hustle. It's just another hustle. I'm not saying don't open your business, but I'm saying be a revolutionary business person. Redistribute the resources that come in. Have a larger revolutionary agenda and say my business is one cell in the body of a black economic system. How do we want to assess and value and process preserve, sustain the world's resources, the wealth of the world. We need to come up with a black economic system. To hell with black business. That's kindergarten baby stuff. We ran the world. We founded the very concept of economics. The first commerce, the first markets came from black people. And here we are trying to achieve within somebody else's ratty, backwards, omnicidal system. We need a black economics, a black economic system, a black economic ideology. And then 
we say, how do we impose this? Just like the white man didn't come here and join the, the, the Native American economy. The white man didn't go to Africa and, and, and engage in the Af various African economic system. The white man didn't go to India or Southeast Asia and practice Southeast Asian economics. He didn't go to China and engage in uh, Chinese economics. Everywhere he went, he brought and imposed his own economic system. Who's to say we can't do the same thing? No, we don't do Western economics. We don't do capitalism. We don't do business in that way. Yeah, you can call what we do business, but we call it something else. We do cooperative enterprise. We, we're not about, we don't establish businesses for the generation and amassing of individual profit. We do it for collective empowerment. Then we can talk. That's when businesses become more than just something to make us feel good about ourselves and to give a small percentage of us a little bit more higher consumption capacity than the rest. So I'm sorry. I mean, if you don't like what I have to say about business, you're really not gonna like what I have to say about interracial relationship and the, the capacity to reform races. But I think I need to, to get to, to my topic because I really have. But then, hey, there's always tomorrow, 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 I can go home. Mama don't want to see me this way, find me this way. Um, today's show is entitled From Barbarism to Decadence. There was a uh, social scientist who stated that, and don't ask me the name of the social scientist, a lot of times I'll hear a profound quote and the quote sticks in my head for decades, but I sometimes the person who said it. so. I'll look it up and post it online if you must know who said it. But it, there was a uh, scholar who said, America is the first society to go to barbarism, to decadence, having never reached civilization. Which is an enormous statement. Because the normal evolution of both empires of antiquity and modern empires or the idea is that a society starts off being barbaric or primitive society. And then it, as it starts to develop in technology, expand territories, establish laws and protocols and customs, it becomes a civilization. And then as the comforts of civilization uh, begin to make the people less ambitious, make the people slothful, make the people unappreciative, of how they came to get to where they are, civilizations tend to lead to decadence. And then from decadence, you will eventually drive you back to barbarism. And that is the cycle of human complex integrated civilization. Barbarism, civilization, decadence. And barbarism leads you, and again, we're talking strictly from the Western historical perspective. Like I said, white folks are brand new. Africans have had single civilizations that lasted for 38,000 years of consistent history. The Chinese have had dynasties that have spanned 10,000 years. America was founded in 1776. It's not even 300 years old. And it's already showing advanced signs of, uh, of decay. But even the Western empires, you have the, the time of re, uh, Renaissance. So the Dark Ages, barbaric. And then the Renaissance, civilization. And then the decadence and the fall of the, of the European Empire. The sun finally set on the British Empire. So the barbarism, the United States came about at the time of, of, of the start. It was the first industrial empire that was founded in, in the modern industrial era. Like the British Empire started in what they call the Steam Era and the Renaissance Era, you know, and, and uh, of course the Greco-Roman Empire. But the United States had the advent of, of, of technology and weapons and communications tools. It was the first fledgling empire to come up with all those other technological advances. So the age of discovery. And so the United States has never reached, has never established a culture. It's too young. So the United States is a bastardized society with a bastardized culture. And most white Americans, you think black people are like, oh, we're African Americans, we black, we Negro, blah, blah, blah. Those aren't ideas. Black people have never had an issue 
with really identity. The only time we start to struggle with identity is when we try to tie ourselves in with white folks. And when, you know, we want to be equal to white people. White people in America are the ones with the identity issue. But again, we don't look at white people from the same critical lens as we look at ourselves. So when white people fight each other, we don't call it tribal warfare. You know, Trump is not called a strong man. He's not called a dictator. You know, even though he took the, took the throne illegally. Now, if Trump was, if there was an African leader, Mugabe, what would they call it? The Mugabe regime. Not the Mugabe administration. They call it the Trump administration. You know, so they don't use the same critical lens. So even when white folks engage, not only engage in the same behaviors as so-called lesser people, of the mud people, the darker people, even when they engage in the identical behaviors that we engage in, we use more dignified language. I ain't heard nobody call Baron Trump an anchor baby. I ain't heard nobody call Melania Trump the porn star whore that she is. I ain't heard nobody talk about Trump's baby mamas, Marla Maples, and the other chick, foreign, from foreign. So, when we think about the U.S. empire, and the U.S. has always been an empire, it was founded to be an empire, all the presidents, their main duty is to advance the empire and sustain the status quo, which is imperialism. V.I. Lenin, Vladimir Lenin had said uh, that is the ultimate goal of uh, the highest manifestation of capitalism is imperialism. That is the, uh, the key in when you have a, a market based on perpetual expansion, perpetual growth. You will have to expand to territory to sustain perpetual growth. As you expand territory, you're going to run into other people who are already established on that territory, and you have to either bring them in integrate them, suppress them, or exterminate them. And America's like, I'm good with the latter two. And so, there's always been a lot of talk from my side, from the black conscious side, the revolutionary side, the non-alignment side, about the fall of America. But there's never been any evidence that America has fallen, or any empire has fallen. That's why I try to focus on more accurate language. What's happening in the United States right now is erosion. Every empire must fall. But the United States has been an accelerated empire. The United States has done everything accelerated because this the United States was the first and I think will be the last. I don't think that even though China is, is flirting with imperialism, I don't think we'll have another global empire after the United States. I think the era of imperialism and even the era of uh, uh, market capitalism and industrial capitalism is done. The, the planet, you know, and whether that done means that humans wake up and start to behave in more rational ways or that means that uh, the, the earth no longer has the capacity to sustain complex life forms. Either way, both of the, either one or the other, one or the other is going to happen, but the latter is happening. The, the earth is losing its capacity to sustain complex life forms. And you can't go raid and pillage people if you don't, can't even breathe the air and you can't drink the water. But um, the United States empire is eroding. And, it, and, and the United States has gone from straight from barbarism to decadence, never achieving civilization. Because the United States has done everything at an accelerated pace, unlike the British empire that was built up. Remember, at first it was a, a local empire, local warlords, and then it was a regional, and then a continental, and it slowly progressed to a global empire. Over the course of centuries, actually. The United States did it in a couple of generations. And so, because it grew and, and, and expanded so aggressively, that means its collapse, eventual collapse, is going to come eventually too, but... We focus too much on the collapse and we ignore the erosion. And if we pay attention to the erosion and the rate of erosion, then we can better navigate the collapse. And I know black people are very fond of talking about tearing down the system and this and that, but we have to be honest. Many black people are dependent and integrated in this system, not by choice. 
But it was very obvious when people talk about the system, when the system retracts, we suffer first and we suffer the most. And we're very vulnerable. I was just in Wisconsin. I've gone all over back. Uh, next month, holla at me, I'm gonna be in um, Oakland, California, Bay Area uh, um, for, for a week. So holla at me, I'll, I'll post and, 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 and let everyone know when I'll be in um, California. Not my favorite place, but I, I, I'm very fond of the people, but the, the, the location, it's not my thing. But anyway, when, when a, uh, a lot of our, I see that black people live in these population centers. And in every black population center, Chicago, uh, what formerly New York City, but it's still a significant amount, um, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, Kansas City, St. Louis, um, the, the Bay Area, um, parts of, of, of Colorado Springs, you have these population centers of black people in all directions are sa uh, surrounded by racist, well-armed groups of white people. Like here in Chicago, if you get in your car, you live on the south side, you live in central Chicago, if you get in your car, and you head out west, and you head towards Bolingbrook. The system erodes. As the system implodes, white people, we've seen, are very irrational. And they're extremely stupid. I'm sorry to say this about you white people, but y'all voted for Trump. And they even said after this whole Russia summit thing, 68% of Republicans, now they say in the majority of Americans, which means Democrats and independents are like to hell with Trump. But when they ask exclusively Republicans, 68% of people still support Trump. And nobody's saying, who would you vote for, Trump or Hillary? They're just saying, what is your impression of Trump? Stand alone. Hillary's off of the, the, the map, although her, her daughter is going to reemerge. We're not done with the Clintons yet. The scourge of the Clinton political dynasty is not over. But Hillary is not the problem. Y'all need to start focusing on Chelsea, who's every bit the hustler, the shuckster that her mother and father are. Might be better at it, because she's got more teeth in the game. She's been do at it her whole life. So, I'm not saying that we're free. We're free of Hillary, but we're not free of the political, the Clinton political dynasty. So I ain't saying close your eyes to the Clintons, but you know, it's, it's a new game now. It's a, it's a new challenge. But 68%. So um, when the, um, the when some when a when a structure collapses, the people in the basement get it the worst. And we're in the basement of the U.S. economy, the U.S. political system, and the U.S. culture. And the moment that there's the least bit of political instability, insecurity that is extended over a period of time, or any type of uh, institutional collapse. White people are going to go on an orgy of mass murder of black people and anybody who can't be identified with whites. And our white allies, our white liberals, white progressives, many of them will join the other side for their own survival. And a few of them might stand in the streets with us and throw their lattes in the face of the, the charging white hordes, but that won't be enough. And, we, and you don't have to go to Nazi Germany. You can go back as early as the 90s in the Bosnian uh, conflict. And these are white people slaughtering white people, or Serbians and, 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 and Croatians and all these various white ethnic groups. But if you put them all in a room, I couldn't tell one from the other because they all look just alike. Now they have different, it was various ethnic groups. So black people are very vulnerable, even though we conscious militant revolutionary black people are like yes America's fall fall of America bring down the empire in reality <laughs> we have no plan we have no alternatives we have no alternative means of communication transportation armament uh, production of goods and services services we have no alternative set up so it's always funny to me that people like Umar and these other black militants, Farrakhan, talk about the fall of America, the, the, the erosion of America. Now, I'm not saying this to advocate for sustaining America. I'm saying this because black people couldn't save. We can't, because I mean, if, Amer if black people could save America, America would be saved, unfortunately. So I'm somewhat happy with the fact that uh, 
white people don't, black people don't have the resources or capacity to save white folks from themselves. Because if we could, we would. Ask Obama. Obama came hard to the hoop. Obama went so hard in the paint for white folks. It's like, here's some additional health care. Let me save your, 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 your financial system, your automotive industries. He, Obama did everything he could save white people. At the same time, he's trying to carry white people across the, 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 the raging waters. They're biting at his neck. They're pissing on his head. As he's holding white people above the rushing, rising waters, they're literally shitting on his head. But he wasn't going to let them go. And he was trying to, we were holding on to Obama's ankles under the water, and he was trying to kick us off. So he's like, man, y'all pulling at my ankles, y'all going to cause me to accidentally drop these white folks. And I, I can't do that. So I'm not advocating for saving America, and I'm saying we couldn't save America if we wanted to. Because it's an irrational, unsustainable, insane, ecocidal system. Not only is it not worthy of being saved, it can't be saved. It can't be reversed. I'm saying, black people, we need to better navigate it. Stop with the, rel the, the rhetoric of America must be destroyed. America's falling. Oh, this is the end of America. Yeah, that's true. To an extent, to, in, in the proper context, America isn't falling right now. America is eroding. An erosion can take quite a bit of time. If you've ever been like, I mean, I came up in forearm country, and you ever look at soil erosion, it's not like one day you got your topsoil and the next day you have no topsoil. It could happen over the course of years. And during that course of years, you could be growing crops, you could be building on that soil as it's eroding. And so, and the more you build, the more uh, uh, input you put into the land, the less obvious the erosion is. But there are definite signs of the collapse of the U.S. empire. One of the, one of the signs is the emergence of challenging power. That was the whole point. In the year 2000, the United States set up the project for a new American century to say that we're going to stop the, 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 the rise of any power that can challenge us. It was time that the uh, USSR, not Russia, but the USSR, which was a conglomerate, which was a federation of various states, not just Russia. The USSR was a challenge to the United States. And after the collapse of the USSR and all of those nations got their sovereignty, their independence, so pan-Eastern Europeanism was dead, they no longer were able to challenge because instead of the, U the United Soviet States, it was Russia, uh, Ukraine, Yugoslavia, uh, the Balkan states, all these states started saying, we're going to deal with this large conglomerate as individuals. Which means, you know, you lose. It's like when Africa, oh, I'm Nigeria, negotiates with the United States, or Ghana, or the Central African Republic, or Senegal, or a little bitty Gambia. Gambia is a neighborhood. I mean, why don't, <laughs> I'm sorry, my Gambian listeners. But I mean, that's a neighbor, that's like the little poot of a nation. I mean, what is the point? I mean, it's just every white border, if, if, if any white border, it's just an, Gambia, it's a country, but it's just a neighborhood. Why don't y'all just go on and fuse with Ghana, Senegal? I mean, what is going on? Anyway, they always lose because the United States is a conglomerate because they are a pan-European conglomerate. And they got the World Bank, IMF, NATO, and all these international institutions. But there are signs of erosion. One of the signs of the erosion of empire is the emergence of challenges. Because if you're a real empire, people are very hesitant to challenge you. But you have Venezuela, you have Cuba's ongoing resistance, you have uh, Russia bucking the United States, um, unfortunately, there are no real challenges in Africa with the, the Western agenda, the PNAC, and the neoliberal uh, agenda is pretty much African, the African leaders. Now, on the ground, Niger Delta, there's, there's pockets of resistance. In Nigeria, you have the Niger movement. You have pockets of resistance, but no official state resistance. No official state resistance that I am aware of. I mean, uh, uh, you do have the, the economic freedom fighters that is an emerging that can also perhaps maybe 
offer some formal state resistance instead of just you know civilian and, and, and organizational resistance on the African continent. But you look at the Kenyan leaders, the Liberian leaders, the Rwanda and Ugandan leaders, it's, it's really shameful. Uh, Mugabe at least had resistance rhetorics, but his policies, you know, but we, we care more about rhetoric than policies. But I'm not very happy with, with uh, Mugabe's government. I think he was a good revolutionary, but he was a very poor statesman. But anyway, throughout Asia, you have the BRICS, uh, uh, Brazil, India, um, uh, Russia, and what's, what's, what's the other? And China. And China's obviously is the, the, the number one challenge to power. So when you have all these various and, and, and degrees and pockets of resistance, that shows that the, 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 the influence and power and the intimidation, because most empires are just propaganda, from the British to the Roman Empire. Most empires are structured in the minds of the people more so. You gotta catch people's minds. That's more important than the, 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 the sabers and the, and the muskets. And those play a key role. But if you ain't got that mind, any pimp will tell you, if you can't get a hose mind, then you're just going to be a lot more trouble controlling our body. You have to, but the more you got a, a hose mind, then it's easier, you, the less violence you have to use to control her body. And that's what imperialism is. It's a pimp hose situation where imperialist nations pimp the, you know, to be so Christ. So when you got Ghanaians walking around praying to white Jesus and looking to buy Mercedes Benzes and all that and valuing Western manufactured goods more than the dignity of their nation, then, you know, you got their minds hooked up. You know, when you see as, as, as a uh, Haitian or a Ghanaian uh, parent sees as their highest aspiration to send your child off to be a Rhodes Scholar or to send your child to Harvard as opposed to building up uh, your own uh, indigenous educational institutions, then imperialism is secure. But as people start to say, which is happening, I don't want my child to go to a U.S. university. I don't want my child to go work for a U.S. corporation. You know, that starts, then you go from that to say, take up arms and cut off the head, slut, cut the throat of the imperialists. That's why the nations that don't accept Christianity have more effectively, like China has never, I mean, Japan has never been colonized because Japan has always embraced the Shinto culture and identity. And the moment they start saying, okay, let's wear suits and become capitalists, they've had over decades of stagnation. Now it is a, a, a the moment they gave up their culture. And that's why in China, they, when, they, when somebody builds a Christian church in China, the Chinese government will bulldoze that church. That's why the Chinese government said, no, uh, Jay-Z, you can't come here and do a concert. You, we don't want Western cultural contamination. Dale Jones told us 90% of warfare is cultural. And as the Western cultural dominance, things like Nollywood and Bollywood, is people say, we're going to produce our own blockbusters. We're going to produce our own cultural products. And then, like I said, it's, it's in its earlier stages, but it's emerging. And when that happens, that shows more so than armed resistance, cultural rejection ideological rejection, religious rejection. Hell, you go through this, I mean, every day I see, and I keep a strict account, how many black women in, you, in, in the south side of Chicago got natural hair. And I was up in Wisconsin, I was just in Kansas City, I was in New York earlier in the year in the spring, and everywhere I go, I'm seeing more and more natural hair. That is, a, you know, that is a threat to empire. It's not just a threat to the Korean beauty shop on your block. Believe you me, those things are very, very, very important. And you'll never find a successful revolution or even a, a, a revolution that has any staying power where you don't have uh, this cultural component. Dell Jones said 90% of warfare is culture. And he said, when you let your enemy infiltrate and contaminate your culture, it's all Mickey Mouse. It's over for you. But just like I see, the Pentagon recognizes this. The Pentagon hires people that study media and culture and, and fashion trends. You think the Pentagon is not. Like I keep telling black people to say, I ain't with all this talk. Read books. You got it. Somebody just told me you have a theoretical grounding. I'm like, oh, thanks for the compliment. They thought they were in, in uh, um insulting me. Yes, I deal with theories and hypotheses and philosophies and ideas and concepts and vision even. 
not supernatural vision, but just, you know, of course, because I'm a revolutionary. What revol successful revolutionary did? But this is a threat. You got upstarts all over the place, people violating the structural adjustment programs, the saps coming out of the IMF, people rejecting austerity, people who don't want to turn their country into a resort for European tourists to come and have sex with their children, the European sex trade and sex tourism. It's like, no, we're going to start resisting. And there's pockets in Jamaica. There's some state resistance, which is very important, but you can also pay attention to the, the, the grassroots ad hoc uh, resistance and movements in, in, in foreign nations and within the United States. People are bucking back everywhere. And the United States says, yeah, we can keep putting out fires, but it's like Che Guevara and Malcolm X understood. They can put down one Vietnam. That's why we have to have a dozen Vietnams all across the globe. And that's what we're building up to. And I see the, the winds blowing. I mean, if you consume the Western media, you think the United States is just killing ISIS all over the world. The United States is having, it couldn't even put down the Iraqi insurgency. The United States is still getting, uh, has not subdued Afghanistan. And Afghanistan literally has a 16th century infrastructure. They have no highways. They have no advanced communication systems. They have no rail system. It is a 16th century Bedouin society. I mean, it's crazy. Most people there work uh, uh, or live off of subsistence agriculture. And everything, the United States, in order to wage war against Afghanistan, had to build up Afghanistan had to establish an electrical system, a water filtration system. They had to bring and build the country up in order to fight it, you know? And they still haven't subdued it. Literally, malnourished, illiterate herdsmen are holding the U.S. empire at a, has fought the U.S. empire to a standstill. I mean, basically all the U.S. has is the nuclear option. But the, even the, the most psychopathic warlord in the United States, again, they don't call American generals warlords, even though the United States wages war. You know, one African gets a, a Kalashnikov and gathers up some homies. He's a warlord. But a general running a nuclear submarine, he's not a warlord. He's not a, a, a vicious animal. He's a general, an educated, scholarly general. But U.S. warlords, no. If we go the nuclear option, then it's blowback. Even when they went to uh, Iraq, they were using nukes in Iraq. And right now in the United States, the, go look up Gulf War Syndrome. They're literally they're talking about, oh, 22 uh, soldiers commit suicide every day in the United States. And they think these soldiers are like, oh, I'm so heartbroken over going over there killing all those niggers. Nigger niggers and sand niggers killing all these black and brown people overseas. I'm so heartbroken. I can't take it. The guilt is overwhelming me. So I kill myself. Many of them are killing themselves because they have uh, contamination. They have chronic and weird diseases, glandular issues, endocrine issues because of the chemicals that they were exposed to. And a lot of the radiation can even affect your neurological system. Your very sanity. But you can't look into that. And you look at a lot of these soldiers in the VA, they're talking about the VA is so overstressed. Many of these soldiers, they have genetic damage. They have damage to their genome and damage to their gametes, their sex organs. So when they impregnate their wives or their spouses, their girlfriends and when the women get impregnated, they're giving birth to these deformed Iraq war babies. And the government's suppressing these stories. There have been documentaries, but there's been no major broadcast. So when you're saying these soldiers are killing each other, I mean, I've never met a white person so overwhelmed by guilt, especially from committing tri atrocities against non-white people. I've never seen that. But I have seen people kill themselves when they have some type of a psychological, neurological, or physiological issue, and they're not getting proper treatment for it. And not only that, they still have masses of deformed babies in Vietnam. Iraq is contaminated. Iraq is a hot zone. That whole region has been nuked. And they got these, these micro-nukes and depleted uranium rounds, have, have, and, and then it disperses these alpha particles. 
And that goes from, from, from the Middle East all the way to the Horn of Africa. The water, the soil, the air is contaminated. And all of the soldiers come back here and they, they had their bags, their big duffel bags. They are full of alpha particles, radioactive particles and dust. And they throw it on the floor when they get home and they hug their wife. Come home healthy and fit. And then a couple of years later, boom, I blow my brains out. And they're like, oh, it's the, the guilt and the stress. So anyway, the United States has not been very successful. And they've had to go on through extreme measures. And of course, if you look at Western media, you see the, the planes flying and you see the nuclear subs and the aircraft carriers and the Ospreys and all this. And you see the soldiers marching on and it's Veterans Day. Nobody can stop the might of the American empire. And that was true. Until Vietnam. And in fact, since World War II, the United States hasn't confronted an armed enemy. And that was uh, the United States ace in the hole. Do what we say or we'll kill you. And people were like, uh, I prefer death than to subject, being subjugated to you. And so in Yemen, in Somalia, Sudan, Libya, Afghanistan, Iraq, Cuba, Venezuela, Colombia, Honduras, Pakistan, uh, the Niger Delta region, Crimea, all over the world, you have people say, bring it on America. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. So not only uh, is the U.S. facing challenges, the culture of the empire is being rejected, and people are willing to confront the empire. Consequences be damned. And then you have this other thing that Chalmers Johnson called imperial overreach. And imperial overreach means that even if you have all the weapons, even if you have the willingness to kill anybody that defies your will, if you have too many conflicts going on at once, it will overstress the society. It will overtax the society's resources. So the United States has already surpassed imperial overreach, even before it engaged in the uh, Iraq war. The United States, we have the known wars, the documented conflicts. There are seven documented official U.S. military engagements. Seven that they'll admit to. These are places that where our military is engaged, where we have arms and we are engaged in conflict seven places in the world but there's also the black sites the black budgets the the the, the covert wars and when you add on the places that we know, because it's kind of hard to have a covert war, because even though they don't report on MSNBC, Fox News, we're dropping bombs on these people, it's kind of hard to hide a bomb. So there's unclaimed, unwars throughout Latin America. Because we are so upset about AFRICOM, but they also have South, SOCOM, South American military command. In fact, all of these drug lords, when you hear about the decapitation, the mutilation, the murders, every single major cartel leader was trained in the school of the Americas. They were brought to the United States and trained in weapons, in logistics, in military tactics. And then they went there to suppress, suppress and fight the communists. But there were no communists to fight. And I have this skill on how to organize men into a fighting force. That's the only, I don't know agriculture. I don't know engineering. I don't even know how to relate to other people as human beings because I've been indoctrinated into the U.S. military mind state. I'm a killer. So I'm just going to start a gang, start a cartel, and make money. Because that's all I know. Amass resources. That's the culture that I was indoctrinated into by any means necessary. Capitalism. So when you look at the heads of these cartels, they're on the U.S. payroll as well as making money off of the drug trade. And so the U.S. has covert wars in Colombia, has a covert war on Haiti, 
has a covert war in, in, in Nicaragua, Venezuela, throughout Africa. We already know the overt war on Libya, but we don't know about their covert war on the Congo and their proxy states of, of, of Rwanda. Uh, that and and um, okay, it's Rwanda and the other name. I, I have to come up with the other. But Rwanda is a proxy state that's attacking. So there are covert wars. The United States is overstretched. It spends more on its military. I know you're tired of hearing this, but you got to understand the United States spends more on military expenditures than all of the other nations combined, including China and Russia. And that's just the official budget. That doesn't even count the black budget. The CIA, their budget isn't on the books. That when they finance a, a military action, and the CIA has as many planes as the U.S. Air Force. They have as many armaments as the damn Marines. The, the CIA is a covert military. It's not just, you know, y'all thinking James Bond with laser ink pens and phones in your shoe. This ain't no get smart. The CIA is a covert military. And then on top of the overt military, the covert military, you have military contractors like Z or what used to be Blackwater. Billionaires, people have made billions of dollars doing the U.S. dirty work. And not just the, uh, the mili U.S. military contractors, you have the proxy military of the, U of, of the IDF, which is like the fourth largest military in the world that is directly controlled from the Pentagon. The IDF don't move without Pentagon approval and is fully funded and armed by the damn Pentagon. And then you have the Saudi American, the Saudi Arabian military, which is all U.S. equipment all ran by the U.S. So all of Israel, Saudi Arabia, the Colombian government, the Rwandan aggression, all these other foreign aggressions are all should be defined as U.S. aggression. This is imperial overreach. The United States cannot sustain this. And you wonder why there's potholes in every street. Why, why the United States can't set up a modern rail infrastructure, can't set up a modern uh, uh, the, the, the empire state, the, the, the very city that is the, the home, the throne world of the, of the economic throne of the, the Western Empire. New York City, Wall Street, it experiences blackouts. They have a, a decrepit uh, grid system. And when I was there, there was a all complete blackout. And people were in the streets breaking into businesses. People were out on the sidewalk barbecuing everything in their freezer because the power just went out. Wasn't even a storm. Because the United, the New York City, the Empire State, the home of Wall Street, doesn't have a, a modern, updated uh, electrical grid. Kansas City, Missouri, has the their sewage system dates back to World War II. They have not updated their sewage system. Everywhere I go. I mean, yeah, you, you can go downtown Chicago and see all these wonderful skyscrapers where most of them are empty, where they're subsidized by the, the state. All that you think, oh, corporations, corporate power. Every corporation is subsidized, is on welfare, is on the teat. And when you go to, um, you, you go to uh, Trump Tower here in, in downtown Chicago, I can almost see it out my window here. And Trump Tower got like what 40 million dollars in tax subsidies because nobody it's 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 half empty the the twin towers before uh bush knocked down the towers tell the truth it was you when bush knocked down the tower it was more than half empty so it looks good though you look at the chicago skyline you think wow big business big things popping and this is a kleptocracy Imperial overreach. The United States empire is eroding. Its relevance and importance and domination of the world system is eroding. The only thing it still has in terms of is that the Americans still think we're, uh, uh, Obama said, one of the worst things he ever said was the United States is the indispensable nation, which means nothing can happen without the United States being a part of it, being on deck, or United States approval. But for a black man to say something like that is the highest form of treason. That alone should have made everybody quit Obama, despite of the many other things he said. And so 
American leaders still tell uh, red-blooded patriotic Americans, America is an indispensable nation. If it wasn't for us, the world would starve, the world would descend into chaos. But what just happened? Uh, uh, Japan and, and, and the European Union just signed one of the biggest economic trade deals in the world. We already know about the BRICS nation. We already know about China's uh, uh, setting up a trans-European, trans-Asian rail system and pipelines. The United States is being isolated from the global economic community. The only capacity they have is, well, we can blow it up if we want to. But they know if they blow it up, then they're creating more resistance. Right now, there's a whole generation of anti-American haters coming out of Yemen. And unlike Americans who are, have very short memory spans, y'all and already forgot about what happened last week. Other people, that, their, culture isn't, or their culture is rooted in history, rooted in ancestry. Knowing your history, recent and distant history, is very important. It's central to their identity. So while we're walking around like, oh, that was a long time ago. What? The, the invasion of Iraq? Oh, we didn't forget. We don't even remember. The U.S. is still at war with Afghanistan. Oh, that was Bush. Who was Bush? I don't even remember who Bush was. Who's Obama? But they haven't forgotten. That's why they always issuing. If you travel abroad, you'll see they get these things saying, you know, in certain places you might not want to be wearing your Yankee Doodle flag hat. Because we get no love. So imperial overreach and then internal, the internal values. The United States has a very, a fairly decent constitution. If you've ever read the U.S. Constitution, I mean, as constitution goes, you read some other reactionary constitutions. Like in the European, Europe, they don't have the right of uh, free speech, the Bill of Rights. Not that the U.S., like Noam Chomsky said, before the ink was dry on the constitution, the founding fathers were already violating the word and the, and the spirit of the constitution. The United States has never had free speech. The United States has had, never had free and open opportunity. And the right to bear arms has never been respected for all citizens. The list goes on and on. But, I mean, just as far as what's written down. You know, it's like when a scumbag writes a nice love song. You can say, well, the, the song, the lyrics of the song are very romantic. They're a lovely song. But the person singing it is a, is, is a scumbag. You know, so even like the letter of the Constitution, I mean, if I was writing the Constitution, I'd have some of the stuff, some of the provisions in the Constitution, you know, and giving the states a certain level of uh, uh, sovereignty and autonomy, very smart thing to do. You know, allowing each state to form its own character and, 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 and control its own internal economy. Very smart, instead of having a strong central government bring down, you know, and it helped to preserve the union. So I ain't saying, it's some decent stuff in there. But also along with that, there were several unwritten norms for the federal government that are completely being violated. The Republicans have blown up all governing norms. They're gone. So the United States' internal legitimacy is in question. The democracy is gone. There is no, there's, the United States wasn't set up to be a democracy, so it's not really lamenting. The United States can still function without its democracy. But the people have to be under the illusion that there is a democracy. The people have the, have the illusion that their representatives are in Washington, D.C., acting according to their interests. Now, it, it has never been the case. But if you look at the polls dating back to the to mid-70s, people had a lot of faith in government. People really thought that their senator and their congressman went to Washington, D.C. to represent their interests. And people would often say things like, we have to trust our leaders. You know, or people were willing to be patient. Even though they were suffering, they were like, well, once our leaders understand the problem, they'll take appropriate action. That's gone. The, the, the United States is, and the government is going through what is called a crisis of legitimacy. It's pretty obvious that the Republicans serve the moneyed interest. They've always been that way, even when the Republican was the anti-slavery party. You know, the Republican was the party of abolition. But the reason why the Republicans were so forward-thinking, the, the party of Lincoln, emancipating the slaves, is because they understood that if the United States maintains its chattel slave system, then it will not be competitive on the, on the emerging uh, regional market and trade. 
they understood that wage labor is much easier to control than slave labor. That a wage earner is less, much less likely to resist, to burn, to poison you, to cut your throat than a uh, slave. And it is proven that the wage exploitation, the wage slave system has been more stable and suffered less uprising than the chattel slave system. So it was a practical choice to end slavery, not a moral. <laughs> really, they didn't end slavery. They reinstituted it. They reformed it. But all of that, people are, the people are starting to understand that. Even white people, they voted for Trump because they wanted Trump to drain the strong. Because white, red-blooded, redneck, godly, Christian, evangelical Americans had lost faith in the federal government. Part of that was like, how dare they let a nigger take over our government? That was part of it. But another part of it is they don't see the government functioning in their interest. And really, the person who really set that off was Ronald Reagan. He set the tone. Ronald Reagan was the beginning of the end of the Great Society the new, and the New Deal and the, the, the ecological and, 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 and the uh, regulatory system. So you had the regulatory system that was actually brought forth by uh, Nixon, believe it or not. Then you had the New Deal coming under uh, uh, Roosevelt and then you had the Great Society coming under Johnson. That gave you the black middle class. I mean, the black and white middle class and the affluent society and the consumer society that we all love and enjoy now, that came out of those policies. That has been blown up. So basically, the social contract of the United States, meaning that I will be a loyal, lawful, uh, patriotic citizen because there will be certain benefits and securities given to me as a result of my lawfulness, my, my patriotism. If I go, I know if I go to school, if I'm willing to follow the rules of the society, there are certain benefits and opportunities the society will make available to me. No longer. So we got PhDs flipping burgers. We got college professors on food stamps. The social contract has been eroded. And this is a full-on captocracy, uh, kleptocracy, where all of the elites extract all of the benefits to themselves, and they have no obligation to the rest of America. And in fact, the corporate identity. Ford used to be a GM and uh, General Electric and Boeing used to be like, we're an American company, America strong. And you look at the uh, uh, co commercials for these corporations and they'd all be flying the flag and talking about they're Americans. They're no longer. Ford is not an American corporation. Ford says we have holdings in China, we have holdings in Mexico, we have interest in investments in, in, in uh, Switzerland. We are an international company which means we are a company that is going to pimp and get paid wherever, and we have no loyalty with sustaining U.S. workers, U.S. infrastructure, or U.S. interest. And even Trump is now the first truly corporate president. Trump is like, I have no loyalty to America. That's rhetoric. When you look at my concrete policies, it's all about extraction. So everything is commoditized. Everything is resourced. Human resources, extract all that you can. And now the federal government, patriotism is just another tool to pimp the masses. I've never understood patriotism in the first place. I relate to the corporations and the elites in that way. Like, why would you be patriotic? My loyalty is to the world's ecosystem, to humanity, to hell with whatever border or some chance, you know, at birth. I wasn't born no damn American, but I was born human. I was born African, black. But anyway, so patriotism is, indoctr is, is an indoctrination process. So as the U.S. empire erodes, what is bold for black folks? What's most obvious is the potential for a Bosnian-style uh, uprising. That's extremely likely for the U.S. A Bosnian-style mass murder and mass destruction. White people, uh, uh, there was a saying, uh, Winston Churchill said, you can always depend on Americans to do the right thing once they exhaust all other options. So when the, when, when, when the, the final, when, when, when white people in the United States living on irradiated land, drinking contaminated water, being displaced by artificial intelligence and robots, are starving and contaminated and sick, they're going to kill the Mexicans, they're going to kill the blacks, 
They're going to uh, uh, even attack the gays and attack the people with tattoos, or maybe it's attack Antifa, and it's gonna, they're going to kill everybody. But once they kill all of us, they're going to finally say, wait, it's the elites. It's the billionaires. It's the Koch. We should have killed the Koch brothers. We should kill the Trump family. That's, what's, that's how they do. They'll always target the true source of their pain after they kill all the scapegoats. But the scapegoats, they won't even recognize who their true enemy is unless while the scapegoats are killed around. Because all they can focus on is the, the immigrants, the damn Arabs, the Chinese. They did it before. Look at other times, the, the, the 1820 Depression, the 1880 Depression, the early 1919 Depression, the 1932 Depression. Who did the white people go into the streets? They didn't go into the streets and kill the bankers. They didn't go into the streets and kill the landlord and the barons and the industrialists. They went and started lynching black people and Mexicans and, and, and attacking Chinese immigrants on the West Coast and cutting off their braids and, 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 and mutil sexually mutilating Chinese uh, women. But Churchill said, you can always depend on white people to do the right thing once they've exhausted all other options. So eventually they will return to like the Bolsheviks did and have a class re revolution. White people perhaps might eventually realize that the number one threat to their well-being are the white elites, not immigrants, not blacks, not gangsters, not, not terrorists, Arabs, and Muslims, but the number one threat to their well-being. However they define it, whether it's economic comfort, whether it's cultural, whether it's psychological well-being, the number one threat to their well-being are the white elites and have always been that. Have always been their number one problem. But they're always the last people that the white masses look at, the last people that they're willing to take. So uh, the, uh, the white people are not going to have their let them eat cake moment because 68% of the average white American still support Trump after all of this hullabaloo, after he's been caught lying about everything and anything for no reason. But Chris Hedges also says that when the empire starts to fall, the citizens of the empire begin to think uh, of uh, in unrealistic. They depart from reality. They live in a fantastical reality. They think America is the number one nation in the world. They think everything, the universe revolves around the United States as the United States is becoming less relevant militar milita militarily, except for its military. And the United States tells the world, well, I may not be able to outproduce you. I may not be more educated than you, but I can bomb the hell out of you. And as the other nations saying, well, that's true. So I have to humor the United States. But then they send an idiot like Trump to North Korea and it gets played by Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un Jong totally played Trump like a fiddle. He got all these concessions from Trump. And I'm very happy that the North Korean and uh, that North Korea was able to tell the United States to stop the military war games off the coast. I'm very happy with that. It's highly toxic behavior. I wish... Kim Jong-un had told Trump to also uh, close down the, the foreign military bases, to close down the Korean military occupation, the U.S. occupation of South Korea. But then uh, we have um, Putin, Vladimir, also is hustling Trump and telling Trump to, uh, to, to, to disperse NATO, to dissolve NATO. I mean, I, if I was Putin, I'd go for the same thing. And I have to tell you, you, if you don't understand the history of the United States pre-communist Russia, the history of Russia and the Western Europe and the United States, yes, Russia is interfering in U.S. elections, but, I mean, they have every right to. If you just want to talk about what's right and what's wrong, the United States has always been the aggressor against Russia. So Russia is interfering with U.S. elections, but it's, it's a self-defense move. It's a self-defense move. It's not an offensive move. They're reacting to U.S. aggression. But that's a whole nother discussion that I don't have time for. But I, I, I want to play some music for y'all. I do want to play some, some, some presentation. But bottom line is this is what African people have to understand. Even you patriotic freedom, American loving Negroes need to understand the empire is eroding. It's eroding at an advanced pace. But you still might have some years. It might be some time for it to fully collapse. 
But during that time of erosion, for black people, we are very vulnerable. And there's, let me give you three things we as a people must do. We must, uh, you have to understand, because a lot of black people I see online, they're like, well, I'm buying guns and I'm getting provisions. The number one asset to, to survive a crisis is community, collectivism. The people that are most likely to endure and thrive during a crisis are people that have strong community. So you, if you have individualized solutions, and individualized preparation for the e further erosion and eventual collapse of the empire, you're doing it the wrong way. If you're amassing provisions or setting up for, for exiting the nation, it is best to build communal ties, to control and own things in common, to have social comments, start to have your little dinner parties and tea parties and have discussions with the people and their ambitions and see how you can meet with people in your own community and your immediate environment and, and do mutual support for your individual ambitions and construct collective ambition. Cooperative enterprises, co cooperative defense, communal fitness. That's one thing you have to do. We have to make our communities and the areas where we dwell more resilient. I try to, to do, to construct urban militias. But until we're able to build the trust and the camaraderie, and not just this rhetoric of unity, but operational unity where we are sharing resources, where we have ongoing protocols and uh, for, for, for cooperation, where there are mutual trust and, and, and mutual sharing of resources, all this other stuff. You can drop a million machine guns in the middle of the hood and we'll still be vulnerable. In fact, become more vulnerable. You can drop a billion dollars in the hood and it'll still be, you know, hunger games in the hood because without human cooperation, everything else is, 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 is barbarism. Amos Wilson said, the most valuable asset a people can have over natural resources, over wealth, over material goods, he said the most uh, valuable asset people can have is a collective identity and a rational agenda. Dr. Bobby Rice said the most important thing for us to do is construct an African worldview and African social theories and then move on them. So I'm not telling you to abandon the material world, forget all your, liquidate your bank accounts and strip yourself naked and have, all those things are important, but they must be encased within an ideology and an agenda, a rational ideology, a rational secular agenda. So that's number one. We have to start really building community. I'm all for the rhetoric of community and unity, but we have to put it into practical, pragmatic practice. That's number one. Number two, you've got to go overseas. We've got to make our reality an international reality. Right now, Haiti is in flames. They just toppled the government of Haiti. They had a general strike going on in Haiti. We have to be engaged. We have to be pan-African. Because when the U.S. moves on us, they're going to incorporate Israel. They're going to bring Europe into the fold, France and Germany. It's going to be a pan-European move. And if every, every black person in the hood was a multi-billionaire, if every black person, black citizen of America was, was, had a billion dollars and all the wealth they could have, we would still be vulnerable. And what's going to happen is they might move on South Africa. They might move, uh, they already moved on Haiti. They might move on Brazil. They might move on Venezuela. And we're like, well, they they killing people over there. They ain't, but but everything they do overseas, they're bringing back to us. The the, the technology, the te the techniques, and the soldiers come here and they take off the military uniform and they put on the policeman's hat. So we have to understand. We have to build strong communities here, real practical. Pragmatic community, not just, oh, yeah, we all just dress alike. We run around here like the silly Nuwabians or the Asar said, these silly cults. No, we need political, economic, operational, practical, pragmatic, secular unity.
and operational unity. Not all of us dressing alike. You know, I mean, if that's part of the unity, I'll dress like everybody else, but that's just, that's superficial. We have to be pan-African. We have to internationalize our structure. Our oppression is a global system. So you need a global system of resistance in order to confront a global system of oppression. And number three, we have to work to expedite the erosion. When we see vulnerabilities, we need to learn to exploit those vulnerabilities. Trump is an incompetent tyrant. And I will take an incompetent tyrant over a competent bureaucrat like Obama. We need to raise the contradictions of these systems. We need to educate our people. We need to put what's happening in the world, in the country, in our communities, in the proper historical, political context. And people always out here saying, I ain't with all that talking. We have to challenge these people, the, the, the Farrakhans, the Dr. Umars, the people who profit off of our ministry, the incompetent, the ideologue, the demagogues, the cults of personality. We can't afford them anymore. Time is too crucial. So we have to educate ourselves. We have to revolutionize our culture. It's not just for us to be unified. It's not just for us to have formal links with Africa and the, the rest of the African diaspora. It has to be revolutionary. It has to be with the ultimate agenda of dismantling the systems and institutions of industrial capitalism and global white domination. That must be the mission. Not just succeeding within this system, but not even having the option of succeeding within this system because this system no longer exists. And we'll deal with this more. Um, there's a lot more I wanted to get to. I want to talk about this concept of a uh, universal basic income that's coming to Chicago. There's an older uh, woman by the name of Maya Perar who put forth, and they're looking at starting a pilot program. We're giving 1,000 families in uh, poor families in Chicago a $500 a month basic income, and uh, there's research, excuse me, research to show that that does everything from uh, lower crime rates to increase health outcomes and educational outcomes. Uh, the United States is an empire in crisis. Most of our people in our community are going to try to rescue the empire and to continue to elevate within the empire. But we need a revolution. We need a worldwide revolution. We need practical, educated, and I don't mean formally educated, I mean truly educated black people. We need research groups, we need study groups, we need to first know what to do and then do it. We need to evaluate our actions critically, evaluate what we do, to see what is most effective, where did we go wrong. We need to stop with these demagogues, so many of these so-called black leaders who profit from our suffering, perpetuate our suffering, but do nothing to mitigate or end it, who are assets to our enemies. Our leaders are their servants. We have to turn that around. We have to get serious about this. We can't play with this anymore. Because, yeah, at the same time, you know, you're celebrating the fall of America. You're looking at the, the, the utter collapse of the, the global African community and the black American community in particular. We got these clowns telling us to embrace our slave heritage as if that's our fundamental reality and our fundamental identity. These people must be challenged. And that is not subverting unity. Unity is not about getting along. Unity is about having a practical action, practical collective action to carry out. And sometimes that will require internal conflicts and internal struggles. And any struggle that can't deal with internal conflicts, it cannot successfully engage in external conflict. But I'm, I'm, I'm not doing too well with the time. I gotta play some music and I wanna share some scholarship from, from our ancestors. So I'm going to uh, take a musical break and I'll be back with more. This is Bro Diallo Show, Q4 Radio. Uh, DialloKenyatta.com uh, is where you can find my show's archive, where you can download the podcast and, and play it at your leisure. Burn it on a CD and give it away. Um, um, also, you can go to YouTube. Um, I don't know, because I just got suspended from Facebook and I'm back. So I, I uh, if Subscribe to the YouTube page 
uh, uh, YouTube slash Diallo Kenyatta. You can catch the show uh, broadcast live at Diallo Kenyatta. You can find me broadcasting here every Wednesday and Saturday morning at 7 Central Time. Um, uh, that's at q4.org. You can listen live. You can listen on the TuneIn app, Q4, and iTunes Radio, Q4. If you're in the Chicago area, we uh, are on the AM signal 1680. So there's many opportunities to listen. And if you are listening, if you appreciate unfiltered pan-African analysis and ideology, rhetoric, and jawbones, please share the show. Please share the, 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 the YouTube video, share the MP3, uh, share the links. Please share. If you're listening now, please just take a moment, clicky, click, clickety, click. Before you go, you, you, you go. Please take a moment to share, help get the word out. If you're in a position to, please donate. Um, right now, I'm financing the show out of my pocket, by my shelf, with the help of some of my Patreon supporters, but we're still operating in the red, and I'd like to operate in the black. So if you're able to, please uh, make a contribution. I don't get any type of corporate or, or uh, private or public support. Um, my listener, I'm holy listener finance and I greatly appreciate it. and I know I got to get the materials out to my listeners I got a lot of gifts and I'm going to do that because I'm going to be doing a lot of traveling and I'm not going to leave town without getting my people what I promised them. and I know it's late and there's no excuse for it so just 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 uh be patient and it, it's coming it's coming so uh this again bro Diallo show and this is uh KMD a positive cause and much damage a positive cause in a much damaged society, which they said stood for KMD. Anyway, if y'all are into MF Doom, before there was MF Doom, there was KMD, uh, Peach Fuzz. I was actually working in the garden and that came on. I'm like, oh, I gotta play this. I don't think I've ever played this. This used to be one of my favorite songs coming up way back in 1991 when I was, you know, running the streets of Casey. So Peach Fuzz, after that, Quest, and after that, some William Mackey. So stay tuned, Bro Diallo Show, Q4 Radio. No rapper to the girls. Nice and smooth, and I'm